So um, welcome everybody. This is uh, PulpCon day four, a discussion about uh, when the stars are right, aligning pulp and all of its moving parts. And I added the subtitle, when engineers do release engineering. And this is really meant to be a discussion, so please uh, engage. I have only noted down a few um, thoughts I had when I thought about all this topic. And I can go through them. And if there are no questions or no additions, then this will be a rather short session. And this is not to encourage you to do that. Um, but please, feel free to interrupt me at any point. We can uh, jump into the discussion right away. So, um, well, first of all, uh, Pulp is deployed in many different ways. And I think we talked about this at the last year's PulpCon. Pulp has so many installers. Grant, please. Did you mean to share your screen, or is this just a discussion? Oh, right. Sorry. OK. Um, Cool. Thank you, Grant. Because I was like, I went and clicked on the slides for his talk, looking for what I'm supposed to be seeing. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, the, actually, they won't be real slides. It's just the HackMD where I put together my thoughts. Perfect. Perfect. But yeah, yeah, let's look at this. Is it big enough? Should I increase the font size? Make it bigger. One hundred and thirty percent. That looks okay. good to me. Um, so yeah, uh, my first thought: uh, Pulp is deployed in many different ways. We have so many installers. There's at least the single container. There's a classic server installation, usually done by the Ansible Pulp installer. Then there could be a Kubernetes cluster installation, which is, again, container-based. And of course, also, you can do a large-scale, bare-bone, bare-metal server cluster installation. Um, the next thing is Pulp has many stakeholders. So it is a part of, one or, uh, of, of a, a couple of products, both inside and outside of Red Hat. And of course, we also have the community as a stakeholder. And that's usually a stakeholder that keeps rather quiet. That's why we have PulpCon, to get more involvement here. And the next thing, Pulp has many of our plugins. So Pulp has a plugin architecture. And each plugin is developed and released independently. Core only provides a, an API to the plugins. And this means there's a lot of combination of different versions you might want to install. And to uh, the way we try to accommodate this is we have instantiated a deprecation policy. And I can I will try to sum it up as shortly as I can. Um, the plugin API should be compatible for Y releases until a pre-announced breaking change release. And we set it on every one divisible by five. That is like uh, 320. The next one will be 325, then 330, if we keep that pace. Um, Deprecating symbols and behavior is always allowed in all releases. They will just, as long as they function as designed, they will just be very verbose about, hey, don't use me anymore if you want to be compatible in the future. Um, breaking changes, on the other hand, can be the removal of such a deprecated sy symbol, um, stopping of deprecated behavior inside of a function that didn't change its uh, signature to the outside. Um, the uh, goals of this plugin, uh, of this deprecation policy, is that plugin writers can declare compatibility to up to the next breaking change release and don't, do not need to 
um, release after every single call release we do because we could have broken the plugin. So this is mainly to have less release pressure on the plugins. And another goal is that users can upgrade without waiting for all the plugins to be released for the next fresh pulp core release because the old versions of the plugins are already compatible. And one of the goals, not so much of the deprecation policy, but an overall goal we always try to follow is that users should be able to upgrade from anywhere to our latest releases, at least to a combination of latest compatible releases. Let's call it like that. Um, together with this um, deprecation policy, we kind of started a discussion about um, LTS branches. Uh, give me a second. I need to answer the door. I'm sorry. The fun of having a virtual conference when everybody's at home. One time I was hosting our demos and we were at a conference, a real conference then. So I was like outside because that was the only place I could get internet. And it was really early in the morning because we were on the West Coast. And that's when they blow the leaves. And literally there's a recording somewhere out there and there's like this huge dude operating like this leaf blower. <laughs> and I couldn't walk away because that was where the internet came from. Hey, look, it's Matthias. Yeah, hey, uh, I'm back. Um, glad this is a discussion. So I hope you've done good discussions in the meantime. Um, where was I? I was talking about uh, together with the um, deprecation policy, we always talk about long-term support branches. And we never came to a real conclusion here. So this discussion could be to get this topic forward. Uh, problem is, in the end, we could never settle on a scheme that did not make every single Y branch we have long-term supported, which is clearly against the goal. We, do, we just do not have the, compa uh, the capacity to do all of this release engineering and still keep the, um, the team engineering, on the other hand. It is at least challenging to sync all the stakeholders on one branch, and I think we've gotten uh, we've gotten better at that. So we don't need to support all the branches anymore. And one other thing with LTS branches is we do not backport features, which means whenever we have a new feature that one stakeholder actually really really wants, he needs to upgrade, and then he's probably not anymore on an LTS branch. Or this, by definition, makes the new branch LTS, which circles back into the first issue here. Um, the last uh, things I noted are we want to go to zero downtime deployment or zero downtime upgrades, I should say. But we can keep that for later and start discussing here. So Lubosch, go ahead. Yeah, recently we got into the situation where we realized that multiple plugins are not compatible with, it, with each other. I'm specifically talking about the JSON schema dependency. And are there any thoughts or ideas on how to prevent these situations from happening again? If we are talking about branches and LTS stuff, Uh, I mean, on that one, we have a good answer for it, which is the new policy recommendation to plugin writers to broaden their ranges of dependencies. And I can link to the docs for that. But um, to bring it back to the kind of the topic right here, which is, so what do users do when their plugins require different versions of pulp core? I think that's probably the common thing. 
Um, and I think a similar recommendation applies, which is to have your plugged in declare, declare as broad a dependency as possible and then let pip basically do the rest. And Brian, can you expand them as broad as possible? I believe I'm trying to refer to the documentation we were working out. Yeah, so I'll get a link to this documentation here in one moment and um, link it there. But uh, actually, let me let me get the link first and share it, and let me um, hand, hand it over to Grant. Grant. Sure. Um, before we get to zero time updates, one of the issues that I ha well I have an answer for because I have written some some handcrafted uh, scripts to keep myself a little more sane involving uh, partially long-term long branches, partially plugins and pulled core, partially we have a lot of stakeholders, is I'm working with Catello and with Satellite, they're downstream, trying to recreate environments so I can do debugging. And it's, it is useful for me to be able to put myself very quickly into an environment where I can say, I want to, I want to have my um, pulp development environment, all of the plugins that I have checked out in pulp core, in uh, all pointing to the branches that support, say, Catello 4.5. So 4.5 is dependent on, I don't know, uh, pulp core 316, I think. And so I, I say, I, I, would, I want to be able to say Catello 4.5 ENV and have it go and go into my pulp core directory and check out the 3.16 branch and go into all the other plugins and check out the appropriate branches for Catello 4.5 that match the pulp core 3.16 that I'm checking out to. Now I did, I do that. I have scripts that do that because I, I went in by hand and figured out which versions those should all be. It would be really cool if there would be some higher level way to say, I need pulp core 3.x what's the what plug what's the highest level of this set of plugins that are compatible with that and make that happen automatically and i'm not sure what the right way to do that is i'm certain that my handcrafted you know i edit scripts in vim whenever i break something is not the right way it worked but it's not extensible isn't there a little tool i'm sure yeah. there is and I just don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, there's a couple of problems here. And just to name them, at least says how I see them. Like one of the problems is what do users do to determine what they should use when they, particularly for bulk core, when they want to use plugins X and plugin Y together. Um, and the general answer to that is they just, they shouldn't think of it as they're using pulp core. Pulp core is a dependency of their plugins. They should just pip install the plugins and let pip do the work. Um, there is a tool. There's another way to do it, which is use the tool and use like a lock file where you're also um, specifying that dependency, that tool. I forget the name of it. Fabrizio, I believe you wrote it originally. Um, so like there's that's another option. But I, I really think users should just pip install the plugins they want and not worry about it. Um, <clears throat> then for the other problem at hand, which is dependency, uh, like I get a bug report, it's for Catello version something. Um, there are specific branches I should be checking out to reproduce that issue and evaluate it or fix it, et cetera. For that, I think, I mean, I guess my belief is that uh, the reporter needs to be providing those details because we could write automation and tooling and guess and try to get it right, but ultimately, um, I think if they if they want to write a high quality bug report, they need to specify the versions that they're using. That's my. Well, they, I mean, they do, they do. It's just I've got you know a half a dozen different plugins and and core, and I in order to get into that environment, I have to go into each of those Git direct in my development setup. I have to go into each of those development directories and do a Git checkout of the appropriate branch by hand. And I have written scripts that make it possible for me to say just core underscore 3.16 and hit enter. And it goes to all the places it needs to go to 
checks everybody out to main, does an update, pushes uh, you know, uh, uh, rebase to upstream, checks out the right branch, and then moves to the next one, and then complains at me if there was a problem because you know I forgot to stash files first, kind of thing. Um, and I've done that. It just was I was hoping or that there would be a more elegant way to do that than just I have a bunch of scripts that know that if a report says core blah, then I need to have this set of um, uh, plug-in checkouts and then have that all happen essentially by hand. Is there a better way to do that? So let's just assume the issue has the status API output attached. What you would need is a script where you could just copy and paste the component section and tell the script, mm -hmm. get me all these versions checked out. Is that what I hear? That is a, that it, then that does happen. A lot of the bugs do actually have the status output, and the ones that don't often have the yeah, RPM output. Awesome. Sure. Oh, but a lot of bugs don't, because what you're saying is we're, the end user needs to give us that. Well, often they don't, because mm -hmm. end users are end users. They're not developers. They're just opening a bug because things are broken. Even end users that happen to be uh, other folk that we work with occasionally, or even not more than occasionally, will just not include all of that information. Or they'll just say, I had this, you know, I was running pulp core 3.16. I don't remember what all the rest of the plugin versions were. Um, the thing is, in this context, for this stakeholder, if you're running Catello 4.5 or 4.7, you are you are by that very statement, Catello four point seven. You are saying something about which versions of all of Pulp you are using. You're using Core this and RPM that and file the other thing, um, so, and I mean, that's I not would... a user depend a user choice, right? That's is but is but that's what I'm trying to get to is is there a way to do this automatically from a development environment where I could say, okay, I want to check out Core three sixteen. That's what I have. Go figure out what I should be at for all the other plugins, and I don't. And it's not a, can we get that data from the user? It's, can we get that from our own requirements files automatically to make that happen? Okay. I guess what I'm asking. Yeah, for, for Git installations, it's not that easy. For real installations, you would just say, pip install that plugin with the version and all the others just pick what you think. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not a user. I'm a developer. I'm yes. trying to get set in, set up in that environment. Um, and so what I'm hearing is no, there isn't an easy way, and I'm not I'm not nearly as gross as I thought I was for writing this by hand. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's I mean this yeah. comes back to the plugin architecture is knowing that you're in the same environment. You've got to, you have to be careful because just knowing the core version is simply not sufficient. Yeah, I mean um, I end up usually I, like, for like Catello, I look at their RPM repo. Yep. And I just look at the versions of things there. Yep. Like that's, I that's to me that's the source of the truth for what I need to check out. Okay. Um, that's cool. Or I <laughs> no, have random satellite repos. Yeah. Like, well, random other issues. My first question is which versions are you running? Yes. Yeah, and the the other thing just <clears throat> from like a time, like how annoying is this problem? So like yeah, there there's some annoyance there. Yep, that's I understand that. I, I agree with that. Um, well, let me tell you what's really annoying. Um, after you change your branch versions, that the dev environment that you just had running is now has dependency change conflicts. Yep. And yep. and so this is a huge calling card, aka major benefit of the OCI environment. Yep. Because you can just down and up in under you know 120 seconds for sure, versus a close to 25 minute redeploy time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I typically do a reload, and this is this is often a bit of a tangent. But when I'm still, if I'm still using a vagrant box, and I do this on the vagrant box, I do a reload, which is go and um, uh, redo the pip install this requirements file from all of these directories in order to to get all the right dependencies re pulled in. And however. OCI and D is, is way better because there's times where I do that. And then I say, okay, now I'm going to clean out the database. And the database has stuff in it that it can't have with given the code that's currently running. And DB reset goes, no, you can't do, or DB clean says, now you can't do that. 
because um, we have an error that got thrown from from the beginning of Django um, because something in the database and the code and the models don't all match. It can be very painful when you run into that. Um, so I'm a lot happier with the OCI uh, ENV because especially given the presentation that David did about multiple profiles, I can have a profile for each of these and now I can just say OCI ENV profile, you know, Catello 4.7. And magic will happen and the database will be right and everything will be installed correctly. So just learn today a, a better way of doing this. But I still have to set up that profile with the right versions and such, you know, the right, the right repositories by hand, um, which is okay. I was just hoping that there was a no grant, you're being dumb. There's a, here's the way to do this. <laughs> All right, folks, I have a quick question. Uh, I know that we are not done with this discussion, but we are getting into the time for our open discussion. So I just wanted to ask if there are any topics we want to cover, especially I am interested to hear from Brian from Galaxy, who is here in case he came over, not only to listen, but with specific questions or anyone else. Who hadn't spoken up yet. Um, so just to, to see if we need to um, leave some time for you all, or we'll continue the current discussion. Oh, I'm just listening and soaking it all up. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. All right, then sorry for interruption. Um, back to you, Matthias. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we heard the term uh, declare as broad, as broad a dependency as you can. And I want to circle this back to, I think, yesterday's talk about packaging. Um, what we do is we test the dependency that pip installs for us, and that's always the largest uh, the latest. compatible version it can derive from the dependencies. So for almost all our dependencies, we'll, we will never test the code with the lower bound we specify. And yeah, yesterday we heard that the packaging will run some basic, can I start the service, but not can I actually perform things with all the old packages. So I think at least, Somewhere in the pipeline, someone needs to be very careful about caring about the lower bound. I don't know how to or where it should be. On the other hand, having the lower bound uh, risen by Dependabot every second week leads to exactly the I cannot install these two packages together problems. Yeah, and my general pitch here um, has been not to worry about it, basically, um, which is probably not a great answer, but I think it's a practical answer. Um, if there's a problem, we'll hear about it and then we'll fix it. Well, what I was going to say is that our effort to make our tests portable is going to help us solve this problem so that whenever someone builds our PMs, they will be able to just run our tests after they've built their RPMs. And like whatever version of that specific dependency that they're, you know, uh, wanting to ship with the RPMs, they'll have a way to check that it's all working. Um, so it's really hard for us to expand the matrix of what we test. It's just, it, it's untenable. Like you can't test it all. And so we have to pick and choose. Um, and so the best thing that we can do is provide tests that somebody can run for a specific set of packages. Yeah, and I agree completely with that. And I wouldn't be offering hope as a strategy um, if I thought there was any other option. It's basically like my last resort. The term untenable or intractable, I think, is a good way to describe that matrix.
but I personally like our dependencies getting their versions updated whenever new versions of those dependencies become available. I, I it's just we yeah like we need to uh, find out about issues as soon as possible so that we um, yes can... sure that that that's the upper bound and that's all fine um i'm mostly worried about the lower bound which we just don't test and the thing is at some point well, someone we, we, we tested it at some point in the past <laughs> yes but now someone changes our code to use a feature from the library that wasn't there back then yeah and now we're in a bad yeah. situation but then again yes um, there's probably nothing we can do about it and i think that's the answer to your question to wash it can you agree so um not this particularly helpful answer um, in fact, it's probably not very helpful, but um, uh, with with Rust, there's actually a tool that lets you automatically downgrade all your dependencies to the minimum bound so you can test them. And I don't know if something like that exists in Python, but maybe. Yeah, I mean, if we did have something like that, that would be that that would be a way to do it um that would be a way to do it and so you would always would you like always test with the lowest bound and then with the highest bound yeah i mean like the regular runners all do highest bound and then like all the pr runners nice. i mean i guess maybe you do it with every change so i guess it's both all the time yeah maybe yeah. Um, maybe we, this can be done with a lock file. You can. It definitely can be free. done with a lock file. Yeah. But the burden is then on the developer to update the lock file whenever a new dependency is introduced. Well, I think there needs to be automation that generates the lock file because, yeah, it would be. <laughs> Well, it's generated from what is currently installed. If you just do a similar, uh, simple install, then the lock file would just get the same latest packages. Yeah, yeah no, what I mean is that um, we could do an analysis of the requirements, the TXT, and generate the lock file that we want to use for the install. Um, or whatever. The app, maybe it's not the right file that I'm thinking of, but you can. Um, Yeah, basically a requirements file. It would be generating a requirements file and using the lower bounds of the requirements and then using that to do the install. Um, so I have tried tools like Poetry and, and um, whatever uses pip file and whatnot in the past. And the problem I've always run into is that they were never really um designed to work with multiple different interoperating libraries that have different versions so like it's it's kind of like you can install you can have a lock file for like one one project it's like pulp core or something but uh it you you can't really work with pulp core and pulp file and pulp rpm in the same environment in a nice way it just it, it well the, then, it's not set up to work yeah i got you um what i just remembered is that in the installer um and mike keep me honest here uh we do a uh, look at the requirements of all the plugins being in installed and we try to tell the user if there is a conflict and now what i'm remembering is that the latest version of pip already does this for you yeah the latest version of pip like it it tries 
oh, the latest version is not compatible. Let me try one version older, one version older, over and over again. It's really smart, actually. It's but actually, um, yeah. But let's talk about what we do in the installer. Um, we collect all the versions into what file? What type of file is it? It's requirements.n. It's a mm -hmm. format for the for the. It's a format by the the software called pip compile or pip tools. And it can tell you if all those requirements are compatible. Yes. Is that what we would want to do? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think this is not exactly the, uh, the same topic here. What we are at is that uh, plugins claiming to be compatible with libraries of certain versions and actually being compatible is sadly a different thing. Yes. And so when we talk about the CI testing with old versions, that's not PIP trying the newest version and backing yeah. up if compatibility or incompatibility claim. Thank you for bringing us back, Matthias. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So we would have to basically have some kind of automation for figuring out what those lower bounds are and installing those the lowest bounds of packages. And right now, I'm not highly motivated to like have anybody uh, work on something like that. Um, um, how about this? I think we require every dependency to have bounds and explicitly both bounds. Mm -hmm. um, we would probably not want to lower any existing lower bound. But the challenge is we want to know when we need to bump on a lower bound. So That's right. you could just extract all the lower bounds from a requirements file and make that a basically lock file. Mm -hmm. That should be automatable. It's not dependable, but also raising the upper bound when just opening a new pull request. I suppose that we want to afterwards create a new script that will be run in our CI probably every time or before release or nightly. And with that, we can just discover whether that nightly or whether the pull request opened by dependabot just created some issues with dependencies or not. Yeah, see, this is again at the upper bound. Dependabot only bumps the upper bound for us. Yeah. And not so the we've... lower bound as well. It no. does not know it only. And we don't want to bump the lower bound just because there's a new version of the library. We only want to bump it when it's necessary. On the other hand, we want to try the new version as soon as it's available, and that's where Dependabot helps us. Because and we see those for that breakage in the Dependabot PR, like all the tests break because Dependabot said, "Oh, they released a, a five version." You know, or a five point one version, and that fits, and so you get it, and now everything breaks because it's an incompatible change. We see that happen regularly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and that part absolutely works for us. Well, what? Okay, so what, Matthias? You suggested, I think, is pretty simple. Like manually, just put together this lock file for a plugin, and introduce another. Uh, workflow or a job to the workflows that we run um, that uses that lock file to install the dependencies instead of the requirements file. I'm not saying we need to go out and do this, but that's what I'm like uh, envisioning as a solution to testing the lower bounds. And whenever we see a breakage, 
on that job it indicates to us that one of these dependencies uh needs to be bumped up um, and that should always come with a pull request right because it's we changed something which made the old version incompatible yeah yeah it would need to be run at a uh, pull request time yes for this to be effective yep i believe so okay um i would say this is at least a nice conclusion for this discussion it was kind of obvious we won't solve all the problems and i would be happy to say let's go to the open discussion and maybe take something off the parking lot is there anyone dedicated to lead that session well we have like nine minutes left um so we should just cover whatever <clears throat> we want or talk about whatever we have or um, yeah Con continue on this one um oh <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's i don't know what we can discuss in eight, uh, eight minutes here we can give back eight minutes to everyone All right, cool. I'll stop the recording at least. <laughs>